All right. Hey, we want to say shout out to our sponsors, Watchman Cigars, Red Hill Brewing, Crave Bath and Body, and Level Up Logo. Listen, guys, it's getting to be summertime. You guys are getting ready to go on the family vacations, the cruises, the uh, family picnics, what have you. And, you know, you got that one uncle that just kind of goes off on his own and you're like, hey, where did Uncle Bob go? And then you look over in the corner and he's peeing on the tree. You're like, oh, man, if only we had a really cool designed shirt that we can all wear that says, where's Uncle Bob? And we get, you can find Uncle Bob a whole lot easier. And maybe he's not peeing on the tree. If you just go to Level Up Logo and you get a bunch of custom made t-shirts for your family reunion, what have you. And then you're like, oh, there's Uncle Bob. And then you can just corral Uncle Bob and not have any problems. So if you don't want Uncle Bob to pee on a tree, go to Level Up Logo, call my man Eric, and he can hook you up with some awesome t-shirts, quality product, and at a great price. All right. <clears throat> that was a lot. Uh, 15 to 12. Uh, so <laughs> if you don't know, uh, <laughs> I'm a huge Kentucky basketball fan, but... I love you guys a lot more than, well, not a lot, but mm-hmm. uh, slightly more than Kentucky basketball, but they are playing right now in March Madness. So throughout the show, I'll be giving just random scores to, to vent my frustration. So anyway, thank you for tuning to the Southern Fried Philosophy. Po- bleh, bleh, see, thank you for tuning in to the Southern Fried <laughs> Philosophy podcast, where it's our take on life, liberty, and the pursuit of gravy. While you, the listener, are invited to come up on the front porch, Grab a beverage and set a spell. We've got a great show lined up for you, as always. This week, we have Justin Wallace. He's pastoring a church in a deconstructed, deconstructing era. Uh, so we'll be talking to him about that with our new series, The Pursuit of Deconstructing Faith. But without further ado, I'm not the only uh, point guard going tonight. Uh, no, I will be introducing the rest of our team. Of course, we've got <laughs> Magic Man somewhere in the United States. What up, what up? And of course, the the lovely, the beautiful Brian. How are you hey, today? Yeah, right, that's what I was waiting for. I knew that was gonna be me. <laughs> you, you, thought hey, guys. I, you thought I was going to Aaron, but I I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Aaron. How are you, Aaron? I'm good. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thanks for asking. <laughs> uh Aaron, where can our folks find us on those socials? All right. Um, we are on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, SFP Radio, uh, YouTube and Facebook. We are Southern Fried Philosophy. Um, on our website, you can find us at sfpradio.com. Uh, we have all of our social media links. You can contact us, leave us a five-star review, uh, donate to the show, and leave us a voicemail. Um, leave us a voicemail of like uh, a really funny story that happened to mm-hmm. you, maybe. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Maybe people will leave us okay. voicemails. <laughs> this week it's the topic is a funny story, something that happened to you. So yeah. click on the little microphone at the bottom right hand corner of our webpage at sfpradio.com. Leave a funny story. We might play it on the air. We might just sit around and laugh at it and just enjoy it. So we would appreciate that. Next week, we have Jeremy Coleman. He was supposed to be on this week, but y'all uh, say a prayer for him and his family, just going through some stuff. So hopefully he'll be on next week. Nothing major, just you know, some sickness and illness. So uh, just pray for him, and uh, we'll have him on next week. Uh, we want to say shout out to our listeners from Indiana, next to the great state of Kentucky, and we're tied up. Uh, Magic Man, do you have us <laughs> some facts about Indiana? <clears throat> yes, sir, I do. So first of all, here's an interesting one. Okay. In right. Indiana, mustaches are illegal as long as the bearer of the mustache has troubling a troubling addiction towards kissing people. So no kissing if you have mustache. <laughs> kissing addiction? Yeah. Oh. If you have a troubling kiss. So basically the law is is if you have a mustache, you, you you're not allowed to kiss anybody. Well <clears throat> honestly, I support that. So so if you have a full, <laughs> full face, full beard, goatee, whatever, wow. th- does that count as well? You know, it's know. scratchy. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, not if you use a that- uh, Crave Bath and Body uh, beard oil to moisturize. That's right. All right. All right. It's soft. That's right. And it's like up your beard it's like laying your oil. face in a fleece blanket. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. 
So Aaron, you're <laughs> anti kissing the mustache. I know I could speak for it's probably the other three people. We don't kiss mustaches, so it's itchy. Yeah. Women have like soft skin, you know. We don't have like I could explain like it. all this hair, so no. it's very itchy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica says no kissy because it itchy. That's what mm. she says. Is it itchy? So, yeah. <laughs> That's what she said. That's a show title right there. That's what she's, um, we're that's kissy. <laughs> there we no go. kissy because it's itchy. All right. Uh, yeah. So I can mean a lot of things. Get any, <laughs> I get some sugar. Uh, so, all, all right. right. Keep going. Anything else from Indiana? I got, oh, I got plenty here. Uh, so, <laughs> come on. One of the greatest Christmas films was filmed mm. in or based in Indiana. Die Hard? Christmas Story. Oh. Mm. <laughs> that's the second I knew that. Uh, yeah, I knew you were yeah, going to say uh, that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're going to shoot your eye out. Yeah. 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 And, and a Ralphie. bunch of other words that, you know, when he was beating up the bully, couldn't, yeah, you know, we can't really oh, say yeah. that. I'm about to say those here if we lose. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so Raggedy Ann dolls were invented by Marcella Gruel. Oh, boy, I'm butchering that name and I apologize. Marcella Gruel of Indianapolis. Um, and, mm. and they created the doll back in 1914. <laughs> and then here's a few. Uh, lastly, I've got a few uh, famous names, a few famous folks from Indiana. First one okay. is Garfield was created in Indiana. Uh, his uh, okay. creator, Jim Davis, is from Marion, Indiana. Okay. And of course, we got uh, Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five from Gary. Um, of course, our former vice president, Mike Pence, also former in, um, Indiana governor. And finally, the most famous person out of Indiana is the pastor Justin Wallace? Mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that he probably gives good run for his money to David Letterman, who's also from Indiana. That's true. That's yeah. true. There's that. <clears throat> All right, well, I'm gonna get, ask you guys like I ask you every week. I be Duran, Magic Man. How you be Duran? I be doing pretty good. Uh, we are in a new location this week. Uh, did a little bit Ooh, of a drive on um, this past Saturday. We are in the bustling metropolis. I said that before every place we mm-hmm. announced we're at. We're, we are in Fulton, Mississippi, which is, uh, I don't know, about 30 minutes west. No, 30 minutes east of um, Tupelo. And um, we okay. are staying at the uh, Witten campground. And we love this place. This is a very nice campground. Plenty of places to walk. Um, the weather is is beautiful. Of course, you know any campground, the weather could be beautiful, but okay. there's like spaces between the campsites, so you're not like on top of each other. Um, okay. and there's, there's lots of natural area, and, and we love it. It's it's great. And nice. uh, next door to the campground is a marina, and at that marina, there's a place called Guy's Place. Um, oh my gosh, it's called Guy's Place. Something on the water, water dining on the water dining. And it that is it basically um, no no not not Guy Fieri. Are you in Flavor but, Town? Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> maybe. Who knows? Another show title. <laughs> yeah, um, but we went there uh, Saturday night when we got here, and um, uh, Lori had the catfish, and I had uh, chicken tenders, and it was very good. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, the kids' um, meal is what I heard you say. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. How do you judge but a restaurant the, by chicken tenders? <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, right. hey, we we judge restaurants by chicken sandwiches, so you know it's not that oh, far that's off. True. You're, you're yeah. right, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, no, the, the service was really good. Price is good. It's right on the water. Um, kind of reminds me of uh, this restaurant that, and actually the name of the marina is called Midway Marina, which there's one of those on Lake Norman. Yep. And uh, there was a restaurant there, which I understand is now closed, but there was, uh, I know my uh, family and I, we used to go there and eat every now and then and, and enjoyed it. So it kind of reminded me of that. Uh, but we, we enjoyed our parrot, meal there. Right? It was a really good place. It's a blue parrot. <laughs> blue parrot. Blue parrot's actually on the other side of the highway 150 bridge from. Oh, you were on the there. other one over by uh, Queens landing over that way. Um, it, it's, that's where Midway mm, is. No, it's, um, it's, 
so like if well, I don't know, there's yeah, people here. Like, it's what a are Lake they Norman talking Geography about? Podcast, yeah. guys. Everyone knows yeah. exactly yeah. what they're yeah. talking yeah. about. Yeah. So if you turn left after the bridge, what are the coordinates? Yeah. Go, up the, <laughs> go up to mile marker five, hang a left, okay. and then turn on the right cove there. And yeah, there you go. No. It's, By that broken down shell, shell station. Ever yonder. <laughs> yeah. Half click. The half sunken boat. Yeah. There so, yeah. We, <laughs> we now we we enjoyed it, but um, we we've really been enjoying this campground. This has been, uh, been one of our favorites so far. Um, so yeah, doing uh, enjoying the uh, RV lifestyle here this week. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you enjoyed the chicken nuggets. <clears throat> That's a good job, Aaron. How you be doing? Chicken strips. <laughs> oh, chicken strips. <laughs> Correction. Uh, now it's semantics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you do you dip it in ranch or honey mm. mustard barbecue barbecue sauce that's the greatest question okay. you've ever asked barbecue sauce yeah barbecue sauce that's uh, uh, no mm, that's the wrong answer ranch is the way to go no surprises there really oh yeah but it has to be the whole thing ranch like, is so inconsistent like, though that's the problem you go and sometimes that's it's what like, I'm, like brian what am i about uh, to say okay sorry i'm about to P- say. please continue <laughs> <laughs> that if it's not restaurant <laughs> homemade, no. Second would be honey mustard and then barbecue. There you go. Okay. That, right. That's the correct answer. And Brian's going to say he does. Sauce. He loves the Polynesian sauce. Well, you can only get that in one place. So, right. Yeah. Uh, my well, default's honey mustard. How do you though. bring your own bottle? Well, honey, yeah, mustard around, uh, honey mustard yeah. in general, but the honey mustard's inconsistent too because sometimes they, mm-hmm. they, they it's honey Dijon, they call it honey mustard, which isn't that's, the same thing, true. right? That's true, yep, very true. It's awful. Anyway, um, I'm good. Yeah. Um, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the that was a hot debate there. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> hot, hot topic. I, I'm suffering a little bit this week with the with the weather. I've got really bad allergies, so I'm on. Ooh. I'm struggling. <laughs> as it, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be diligent about my allergy medicine, but you know, eyes are watering, a little stuffy. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. oh man, things are going down. So I'm sorry. And the news says it's only going to get worse. Good times, right? <laughs> this hasn't even started yet. <sighs> Yeah. What I'd like to know I is know. what do you have up in that mason jar? Um, just a little, a little uh, Savion Blanc. Mm, look at you getting mm. fancy. I'm impressed. I, I am impressed. You know, I'm normally a red wine drinker. Mm-hmm. Let me go on this tangent for a minute. Okay. Please. So normally yeah, I'm a red wine drinker. And I, what, where, where was I? I was at a restaurant like last week or something. And I was like, I'm getting fish. You know what? I'm going to get a white wine. Yeah. I'm like, all right. That's the way to go, right? Sure. Fish, yeah. white wine. That's how you're supposed to do it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what did so, the fish have? <laughs> what did the fish the yeah. the fish was dead. So, <laughs> I I was like, okay, I'll try this. The waitress suggests you know, stupid. Uh, on block and news. it was really good. So, I found it at I don't know, hair cedar or wherever. And that's what I've been drinking lately. I don't like it. There you go. That's good. So the, the but I am cake. a red wine drinker. Yeah. What's the what's the brand? Oh, I think this is I think it's Josh. Have you had that one? Uh I don't know. I'm I'm a familiar. I, I think I this one's one. Josh. I've heard of that. They make you a know, good red wine first, too. I had my first white wine and it was a Pinot. It was super sweet. Yeah. What kind of Pinot? Yeah. Oh, it was in Italy. It was like Pinot Grigio is super dry, mm-hmm. which is not Pino, sweet. Is there a oh, Pinot Noir? Noir? Yeah, Pinot Noir is, is red? red, which is a little bit sweet. Yeah. I don't know, mm-hmm. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> no, I had some. Did you know that Pinots you know, are like way harder to make than like Cabernets and Merlots? Mm. Mm-hmm. So not. it's actually like, it's like more sophisticated if you like, you know, can get into Pinots. Oh. I do like a good Pinot Noir. What? What, what was that, Aaron? If you can give me what? <laughs> so you're like more sophisticated if yeah. you can get into the Pinots, you know? Yeah. Okay. You said Pinot. All right. Pinot. 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 Uh, 
He's oh, right. Not the other thing. Yeah. Not the uh, other thing. Not, not okay. the right. there's other vowels not, that you could have said. Um, <laughs> not the. It yeah. was not in my world all this week. <laughs> wow. So weird. Yeah. Wow. So it's a uh, St. Patrick's Day, guys. I don't know if you guys knew that or yeah, not. It is. Oh, yeah. The, 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 the day Happy morning St. Patrick's Day. We're recording at St. Patrick's Day. This is actually a green shirt. If you can take it, looks weird on camera, but um, hmm. it's green. Aaron's got some green. That's about Your it. Eyes are green. Uh, so, uh, do you guys participate? Like, uh, for some reason, I feel the need to maybe drink too much on this day. I don't know why. If it's a commercial thing. Sure. That's I mean, I start, when I start, woke up this morning, there were there was a four pack of Guinness in my refrigerator. Right, there's mm-hmm. three of them wow. in there right now. There's, no, there's, excuse what? me, there's one left in the refrigerator. Right there now. you go. Okay, because <laughs> he's clearly drank the other three. I had one at lunch, then I put one in my beef stew that was going that went in for dinner, which is delicious. Okay. It was great, and I had one with dinner. Mm-hmm. Right, and there's still one in there because I switched to Irish whiskey. I was like out this afternoon taking my daughter to dance and went, you know what? I want some Irish whiskey because it's, there you go. It's, it's that one day I got a whole bottle for one day. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> well, good for you. Yeah. We won't hear from Brian tomorrow. <laughs> it's entirely possible. <laughs> if he edits the entire podcast tonight, we'll know what happened. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, oh, I, that's the last thing that'll happen. If uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's not going to happen. Oh well, I am dipping into March Madness right now. Twenty two, mm. twenty six. We're up. Uh, but you know, if you ever get into this time of year, we'll talk about more March Madness stuff in a little bit. But if you ever get in this time of year, this this Thursday is the best day of college basketball because it is on from 12 o'clock until midnight, basically. And it's just all these games that are playing. But what's funny is like, this is the only time anybody will ever tune into true TV or TBS. Like this is the, this is the one time of year where TBS says, all right, finally people are going to watch our network. And then nobody knows what true TV is. So right. you know, like, and all the old people are mad because their their murder show is turned off and is watching basketball. T- TBS um, has good shows, right? <laughs> they used to. I like think. Sit- they have like comedy, Rerun. like sitcom reruns, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't I had cable in now. it's like ten years, so I don't remember. Right. But. Well, now you picked up Hulu, so yeah, you can I just, watch. I, whatever I got you Hulu want. explicitly to watch March Madness. It's the only reason. Did I'm you get Hulu live? It. Yeah. Wow. He has regular Hulu, so he's gonna have to see. No, what I had next zero. Week. I had zero Hulu, so I got the live TV, no ads, so ESPN expensive. Plus. I, I bought the whole thing. I'll be broke in a month, but I can watch the basketball. Yeah. <laughs> but you haven't watched basketball though. Like all of a sudden, you decide to pick it up. I've always enjoyed it. It's just I haven't had time, and uh, okay. I've always liked watching March Madness. I used to okay. a previous job. It was pretty great because me and my boss would set up a TV in my office, mm, and I'd, it would just nice. be on to start for the ACC tournament and for March Madness. Yeah. And like he, he yeah. would come in and out, and sometimes he'd sit with his laptop in my office and work. But it was just on in my office all day, sure. right? So, yeah. So it, that, I kind of yeah. was built into me for several years, and then so there were some changes, and I had to be a little sneakier about watching it all day, you know. Mm-hmm. Now I'm my own yeah. boss, so I was on the couch with the laptop all afternoon. So. <laughs> well, you mentioned this is a story that that will be on our show notes, but we'll just kind of mention it now. You're talking about just you had to be sneaky to watch it. So the statistics from last year uh, during March Madness, the um, production rate at work went went down because people were watching March Madness. Now I'm not saying I do that. But I do have a TV in the office, and my office looks directly at the big TV, and there might be a, a tablet to my right. So, you know, I've got a good view of <clears throat> TVs that I don't watch, you know, during March Madness. But they've lost <laughs> in that week, in, in those two weeks of March Madness, $13.3 billion of productivity <laughs> during those two weeks. $13.3 billion. Who did that math? Seriously, um, you know what? I had it. It was like some some law firm, not law firm, but it was like a uh, somebody. 
get it. Eh, I don't believe it. Look it up in the show notes. But yeah, $13.3 million of lost revenue because production productivity went down. I'm not saying I'm a cause of some of that, but <clears throat> definitely am a cause of some of that. I was plenty productive. Uh, also, so I'm just saying. Also, this is interesting. Uh, you might or might not even care about this, but if you're ever betting on a game while it's going on, like if you're at a bar or whatnot, and you know there could be some time left, did you know that the first team to make 71 points, the first one, whoever, whoever makes 71 first, has a 94% chance of winning the game? Mm. Pretty fascinating. So if you're at a bar, they hit 71. Like, I'll bet you 20 bucks that they <laughs> win this, no matter how much time is left. So wow. just a little fun fact for you on that. I watched one game this afternoon. Uh, they barely got to 71 at all. So I'm just... Yeah, <laughs> so that's a problem. <laughs> All right, here's our Southern phrase of the week. Um, we have we have to have a come to Jesus meeting. Have you guys heard that phrase? And I have to have oh, a yeah. come Absolutely. to Jesus meeting. Oh, you scared me for a second. Like, oh man, I thought you no, were. No, ta- I'm not saying you. I forgot you were. I thought you just stopped in the middle southern of what you were saying and we're just no, no, no dropping no. it on us. No, Whew, no that's our okay. Southern phrase of the week. Uh, this is our Southern's way. Southerners' way to tell someone that they're about to have a discussion. That will probably have some real impact. So, so if you if somebody about tells to have you a comeuppance, uh, a comeuppance, there you go. Yeah. I like it. Oh, that <laughs> legitimately <laughs> stressed me out. You said those words, and I got stressed out. It just, it just <laughs> happened. Period. Just from the ingrained. It's just there. You said thing, that. Huh? How about it? It's a trigger. It's a trigger. It's, it's it, like it, yeah. You, PTSD. Priest Brian's got triggered. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Ooh. Scared. Well, how about? I'm going to sit over here with my whiskey and calm down. <laughs> well, we would talk about the unbearable weight of massive talent, but if you want to skip that, oh, so I you just, can calm down. Just a real quick follow up. Last week, you guys poo pooed the movie trailer I read to you guys. <laughs> then it went to a film. It went to a film festival last week, and it, it got a perfect Rotten Tomato score. You have to preface and tell the listeners what the movie is and it's, what it's about. The, the, it was the the movie was it's Nicholas Cage playing Nicholas Cage in the unbearable weight of massive talent. The short version <laughs> is he gets paid. He's a down actor who hasn't made a movie in a couple of years, and he gets paid by a millionaire or multimillionaire to reprise Nicholas Cage roles just for his entertainment. Perfect Rotten Tomato score. I just want to throw that out there mm. from like 10 people. But anyway. <laughs> it's like those Amazon reviews for like a giant gummy bear that yeah. nobody ever bought, but they they say that it's the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you may or may not have heard, but uh, the Senate has uh, come together on a bipartisan unanimous vote. So in all the chaos that we've had in the world, the Senate, again, bipartisan, unanimous, everyone agrees that they hate daylight savings time. And so they are, uh, it is passed that we will, <clears throat> the Sunshine Protection Act has been passed that we will stay in daylight savings time. It has to pass the House, of course, and then get signed by El Presidente. But um, hey, buddy, we may be done with the switching the clocks back. Are you guys for or against? I have an opinion, Becky. Let someone else talk first. (laughs) All right. Aaron, what are your thoughts? I don't have any strong opinions, but I'm for. You're for? Magic Man? Yeah, I'm for it. Uh, Especially now that we're uh, being more outdoorsy with the whole uh, (laughs) living in an RV thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it's it's nice to have the, the daylight stay out later. And, and not get dark so early. Uh, also, before producer Brian speaks, uh, just know that there are a couple of senators <laughs> that have said, because we're pushing it back, we may also push back school times. So, <clears throat> all right, producer Brian, have your, have your say. What's okay. Your- I think it's, it's amazing, right? That, that the whole, the government or well, the half of the government Senate agreed on this, right? Right. My, pro- my only right. problem is, they picked the wrong one. That's the question. The daylight yeah. savings time is not the is not standard time, right? Which is mm-hmm. the natural yeah. way to do things. So, yes, it's a little brighter in the summertime, but I don't. I think that affects us more negatively, pro- probably 
in general, right? I think some, there's been some sleep studies and things. People say it's if you did that longer, it's the it's going to mess up people a little bit until they get used to it, maybe. But it's going to take yeah. a while. But to, in my opinion, my very strong opinion, they picked they they agreed on the wrong one. So it's like, <laughs> isn't that like the government? Like, hey, we're going to do it, but we're going to do the exact wrong one. It's the opposite. It's the one that it's going to hurt. Yeah. Like it's just like not natural, right? <laughs> It's the standard time. We say that the fallback is the standard time. This is the mm-hmm. standard one we use. Not the spring forward. Nobody wants to spring forward. Nobody yeah. spring. Let's all fall back. And then we'll stay at the fallback. Yeah. The, this is the broken time is the extra daylight, right? This is the one that's not right. natural. That's not the right one to be. But I'm not a politician. Mm. <laughs> um, well, we talked about some uh, Cabarrus County burgers last week. Um, so Aaron, you had one from the hot box this past week. And, and just to recap what that is there, Cabarrus County, where we live has a burger competition for the local restaurants. And then, you know, people just kind of get hyped up about it and they go eat at these different restaurants, try these different burgers. But Aaron, you tried the hot box uh, hamburger. Let me, I'm looking it Mm -hmm. up here. To I can tell you I have it pulled up. Oh, okay. Go for it. It is a uh, third pound burger with tomato, bacon jam, uh, cheddar, and provolone cheese, mm. uh, crispy onions, smoked jalapenos, and garlic aioli. Okay. And what say you? What was your, your thoughts and opinions on said burger? <clears throat> it was really good. It was okay. um, not super like uh, greasy, oh. so it was like hmm. very. Um, I don't know, like the, bu- the their buns are a little smaller. They do like a, um, I don't know what kind it is. It has these like a, not a seed bun. I don't know. I don't know. I have to look it up. But it's like <laughs> it's a smaller bun. It's not like huge. Okay. Like a yeah, but. Um, it's oh, like, like a, a little bit more bun. compact, but it's really good. Like, it's not like, you know, running down your arms or anything. Okay. Um, but it's still juicy. Okay. But it had like that nice crunch from the, um, the crispy onions. Okay. And it was really good. You, you um, mentioned you, you like the crispy onions. Yes, I do like the crispy onions. I like, um, I like a little texture. When okay. I eat something, if it's like a right. a crunch or like, yeah, I like that. So, yeah, it was really good. The two cheeses were really right. good together. I love cheese, so big fan of that. You know, what's what was the tomato bacon jam like? That's the thing that I'm like, oh man, yeah, I'm a little scared of it. Right, right. <laughs> Don't be scared. You're, you know, are you intimidated by the jam? <laughs> let it just wash over you. Just the take tomato it tomato bacon. I like to make. I like bacon jam, but when you're you were throwing yeah. that tomato in there, it freaks me out. It probably tastes it, you like know, ketchup. You really right? didn't taste the tomato too much. Like it wasn't okay. a very like strong acidic taste. You know, like to, okay. it wasn't that tang that, like tomato does. Um, it was definitely more bacon forward. I would say. Okay. Like not like I, a little sweet, but not like yeah. Tangy. But they should call it, it bacon good. tomato jam then, right? For the bacon's first. Right? So. Basically. <laughs> uh, my wife and I participated in the juicy smoked burger from the smoke pit. It was smoked for 30 minutes, made with certified Angus beef and blended with a little brisk brisket fat, then topped with maple bacon jam, which I can get a part of. Mm-hmm. Sharp American cheese, onion straws, lettuce, and tomato. And we 86 to the lettuce and tomato because that's just <laughs> pointless. Um, so, but it I'll was put vegetables delicious. in my burger. Yeah. Why? Well, I'm not trying to eat a salad. What the hell? So, uh, no, I really enjoyed that. Uh, fantastic. The, ba- the brisket fat was perfect. It was juicy. It was falling apart, but it was on top of a brioche bun, which made it a little bit more sweet. Um, absolutely delicious. So I enjoyed that. It looked really good. I saw the picture. Yeah. Yeah. It was legit. Um, so one thing, speaking about food, the the NCAA, yeah, again, with March Madness, they are playing in, in tournaments all across the country um, and, and, and stadiums. So it would be like 
Um, in, in this case, in Buffalo, New York, the Key Bank Center, uh, wherever that is. Um, but it's just a big stadium where they, they can play sports and have concerts and whatnot. But they have a special uh, partnership with Delaware North, which is the um, – uh, the food vendor there. And so they've got some items that uh, on their menus <clears throat> specifically just for March Madness. Again, it's in Buffalo, New York. Uh, I'll go through a few of these and see if you like them or not. And this is the stinger on Weck. It's hand carved top round in a chicken tender tossed in Buffalo sauce topped with house made blue cheese and horseradish cream on a kum- kumaweck. Roll. Does anybody know what a kumo wet roll is? Bless you. Yeah. A what? A uh, kumo a kumo kum- roll. Never heard of it. Uh, anyway, so there's that buffalo chicken nachos, burrito mm. quesadilla. That sounds good. A uh, Reuben patty melt, um, an ice mm. cream taco, three scoops of buffalo ice cream topped with caramel, chocolate sauce, chocolate chip cookie pieces, M&M's, whipped cream, sprinkles, cherries on a house-made waffle cone taco shell. Okay. I don't like the, that doesn't sound good. But then here's the other one is the uh, colossal lobster roll, traditional lobster salad with bib lettuce on a freshly baked house-made roll, which sounds normal. Uh, but, but then it says it's only available in the sweets. And it serves 12 people. <laughs> <laughs> that oh. is a colossal roll right there. 12 people. Good gravy. 12 people. That's like probably $200. Yeah, yeah easily. At yeah. least. Because even just the the food truck one down here for one of them is $27 or something like that. It's ridiculous. There's a picture of that yeah. taco in here. You see that? Mm-hmm. Mm. Is that what that is? And, yeah, oh, yeah. Scroll down. yeah, yeah. Hmm. How about you? It kind of looks disgusting. The ice cream taco. <laughs> I would not eat it. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting that you know they they have special food at these venues for the March Madness. All right. So uh, you said the the guest is here. Is that right? We have guests. We have guests. All right. Let's go ahead and bring him on. Alrighty. And last time I checked, it was thirty-seven, thirty-seven, tied up at the half. <laughs> mm. All right, I'm so upset. <clears throat> Are you seeing the score? Me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yo. I just I I told I told them I said I'm gonna I'm just we're gonna have to cut this thing short. <laughs> What's it like, de- pastoring? All right, that's that's our time for tonight. We're out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, well, uh, Justin, thank you for coming on the show. You've been on the show several times, uh, venting, talking, explaining, preaching, doing a bunch of great stuff on the show. And I appreciate you coming on and being candid and just being real. Um, so thank you for doing that. Thank you. For yeah, man. Um, so we're talking about deconstructing faith and I want to be very clear, um, especially from with our last guest as well, just being very clear that this isn't just throwing out the the baby with the bathwater, throwing out the Jesus with the church. This is just a, a, a fancy word or a term for really diving into your faith, not just going along with it as your parents have told you or taught you or your Sunday school answers, but really diving into these, these tough questions of, you know, how do you wrestle with God? What's it like if you have questions about the Bible or you see one thing in scripture where it's not quite lining up and then how do you reconcile that? Or are people just throwing it away and just walking away because A and B don't match up like we think it should? So deconstructing faith isn't a process of throwing away your faith. It's the exact opposite is how do you make your faith stronger? And so, at least for some, I think for others, they question and they go into it and they don't maybe do the hard work or they they find uh, something that is irreconceivable for them, reconcilable. That's a better word. Um, and so they can't they can't make that connection and, and stay to their faith. 
But Justin, you know this way more better, way more better. You know this better than I do. So let me know your thoughts. What is deconstructing for you? And and how do you see that playing out in the story of pastoring a church or even in your own life? Yeah, man. Yeah, so it's it's really become the uh, hot button topic here um, probably in the last, I don't know, 12, 18, 24 months or so. Um, it's, it's all the, it's all the talk on the, the Twitter verse and, um, and, and it feels like it's one of those things where now everybody has, feels like they need to share their deconstruction story. And, and so, yeah. And I, and I think there's a lot of confusion, you know, I think there's a, um, a lot of misunderstanding. Um, and so for me, um, you know, I, I, I personally went through a period of deconstruction, um, not not right out of college, um, but uh, within the first year or two after graduating from college and being in full time ministry and and um, and seeing the some of the rough edges of of the um, corporation of the church, you know the um, some of yeah. the the ways that it can mistreat people and and some of the ways that. Um, a, a lot of it is like, for me, it was that my questions were often dismissed. And, and so mm. that led me down this road of, well, I'm going to ask them anyways, and I'm going to start searching for answers. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've been, I, I went through my own process of deconstruction. Um, I have walked through that process with many people. I have seen people, um, friends of mine, walk away from their faith completely. Unfortunately, and I have seen people whose faith is so much stronger um, on the other side of deconstruction. The stories are across the board, and um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, you know, um, on on what we're seeing today in the church and what we're seeing, especially on social media. Is there? I would think that there'd be a, a huge difference between deconstructing the church and deconstructing your faith. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's important to um, identify what you are doing. Now, I will say mm. this, um, that that there is a an intimate connection between the church and how what we believe about who God is and how God operates in the world. That that was very true for me. So I, I grew I grew mm. up in the church. I, um, you know, it wasn't all roses. It wasn't all uh, fluffy clouds growing up in the church, but I, I I never had the sense that I should deconstruct my faith um, until until I saw the church not um, uh, not <laughs> bear the image of the God that they mm. proclaimed, and, and that is what mm. started to send me into deconstruction. Um, was rubbing up against those rough edges. And, and so I, I understand where, where the two get mixed up often for a lot of people that I can say I'm deconstructing the institution of the church, but often that is mixed and coupled with deconstructing what I believe about God, because it's, it's the idea of mm-hmm. transference. So I transfer um, my experience with Christians onto what must be true about God. And so and that's, I, I uh, might be just deconstructing the church, but at the same time, I'm also deconstructing what I believe about God, because so much of what I believe about God has been molded and shaped by my experiences with the church. And so it's really hard um, to separate them, I think, for any of us that have um, a lot of experience in the church. Yeah, and, and people maybe why we see a big uh, exodus, I guess, from the church or even people coming into the church for the first time and not sticking around yeah. probably is because, you know, that we're the, the gospel that they're preaching isn't the lifestyle that they're living all the time, you know, in, in rural country churches, <laughs> we uh, use the analogy of somebody coming in and sitting down on their pew and then somebody coming in and saying, you're sitting in my pew. Well, Jesus would never yeah. would do that, right? Like even just yeah. that like small example, but but Christians, that, that's not how Jesus would act. So it, yeah. it's kind of easy to understand why people would do that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, we're all hypocrites. 
So, so if, if we if we need to do a raise of hands, we should all yeah. be raising our hands right now. We're yeah. we're all hypocrites. The church is full of hypocrites. I, I think um, where I I ran into more than just people being imperfect was when people started to use their power to um, mm. to really make sure that people acted in the way that they thought they should act. Um, and so a lot of my mm. experience in the church, my, my negative experiences, my unhealthy experiences were always connected to this holding on or white knuckling of, of power, of, um, yeah, of, of corporate power within the church, of organizational power. And, and that, that to me, did not jive with the Jesus that I was reading about in the Gospels. And it didn't yeah. jive with what Paul would say about the attitude of Christ, even in like Philippians chapter two. And so that was really the disconnect for me. It wasn't that I had such high expectations that people would be holy and people would somehow be perfect. But instead, it was when um, the leadership of the church did not mm. look anything like the Jesus that we were to be proclaiming. It, and um, and that was really the point um, for me where I started asking a lot of really hard questions. And um, yeah, it was a painful place, you know? And I think that's yeah. another thing that we need to name about deconstruction is that it's not comfortable. It's, it's actually quite painful because faith, uh, be, growing up in a faith system, being connected to a faith system gives you a lot of stability. It gives you a lot of security, mm -hmm. a lot of belonging, a lot of purpose. And then all of a sudden, when you start asking questions and you start, you start removing some of the, as like Rob Bell was kind of the, the one to talk about this, like removing some of the, the uh, bricks away from your wall that you had built over time, mm -hmm. that is a very painful, dangerous, and risky um, experience. And yeah. I think it would be really important. I think I think it would go a long way for, you know, this generation of deconstructionists if the church would acknowledge, if church leadership would acknowledge just how painful it can be. Um, mm. It's not an easy process. Yeah. And and just coming in, sitting down, leaving church, that's easy. Right, like, like yeah. you just come in and do you punch your clock in, punch your clock out, yeah. and that's yeah. it. But really diving deep in your faith is where the work and the journey begins. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, one of the questions I have for you specifically, and, and your take and spin on this, is just pastoring. Um, mm. One, like as a pastor, and you're trying to. You're living a different way than what we would see in churches around our area. Um, how, what's the uh, tone that you get from other pastors? We're not naming names. We're not. We're just generalizing here at this yeah. point. But like, like what? How do they look at you when you're just like, I'm not going to be part of this model that really strives for power? Mm. Yeah, I, I that's a great question. I um you know, I I've had experiences where so so at the church that I I help pastor, um we are doing our best to go from a a, a model of hierarchy to a model of um a round table um where we are all sitting at the table where there are multiple voices sitting at the table and being able to um, help us discern where the Holy Spirit is leading us as um, the body of Christ. And, and so some of that means that we've had to make the switch from being a male-led, male-driven um, congregation to a congregation where both men and women are at the table. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that can get really uncomfortable. Like, it's not, not so much in our church, <laughs> um, but, but whenever you start telling that story, um, with other pastors and in other circles. And, um, and you can start to see 
um, some <laughs> of, especially with us dudes, like some of the, the grabbing a hold of and, and the questions of, of well, what are the, all the guys going to do then? Um, and, and the mm. automatic assumption is, well, if, if I start to live in mutual submission, then somehow I'm going to lose my seat at the table, which is not the case mm. whatsoever. Um, it's just that I'm, I believe that I, I want to invite as many voices to that table as possible. Um, the, yeah. another, another, another look that I get often is, well, how, how in the world do you make decisions? Who, who makes, who makes the last call, Justin? Like, let's be honest, you know, right. it's like, well, I mean, we all do. We, we learn how to have conversations, you know, and well, where's mm. the buck stop? I hear that a lot, you know? <laughs> Really? And, uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. And I mean, it, it, I understand, you know, I understand because I've, I've been around this thing for so long that I get it. I just believe there's another way. I, I really believe mm. that uh, obviously, obviously, I know this is a shocker newsflash. We haven't been doing so well at this lately. <laughs> what? Right. Yeah. So what? maybe. We need to review and and yeah. ask, are there some adjustments that we can make? And and maybe we need to listen to some of the questions and some of the challenges of the crowd that is deconstructing, whether it's deconstructing the church or deconstructing our foundational beliefs that we have held to for so long. Maybe mm. we need to listen and maybe we need to enter into the conversation and maybe we need to ask are there some blind spots that are going to make it really uncomfortable, but we can at least take a look and we can at least have the conversation. Maybe we mm. should see if there's a better way. Wow. Why do you think that other pastors aren't willing to even do that? And I'm not trying to put you on a pedestal because Lord knows that no. I've knocked you off that pedestal, or I feel like I've tried to knock you off the pedestal. <laughs> Many times, yeah. Um, but but why do you think pastors do that? Like, just because of the power issue? I I have a buddy who challenges me because I talk a lot about power and the and the temptation for power, and he pushes me really hard. And so let me let me not let me not jump to the power. I, I think there are some other okay. things going on. I think okay. I think one is that it it's honestly it's easier. It's it's easier if there's just mm. one person in charge. Like yeah. you make the calls. It's faster. It feels more efficient. Um, you have more control. I get it. Um, the other thing is, um, it a, a lot of times pastors feel this pressure to protect their the baby, their baby that they're leading, mm. and to protect their livelihood. And so oh, yeah. there's a temptation of security at play. And it's really, really difficult for pastors to name that, that there, yeah. I am being tempted in the area of, of security. Um, you know, that I, what happens if I start to rock the boat? What happens if I do start asking tough questions? What happens if I, if I do move to a model of, of leadership where we're all around the table and someone, someone does disagree with me. Like, what happens if that if that takes place? And so, I think there is a massive temptation of of security. Um, and mm. and I, you know, it's so cool. Like, I I have the opportunity to sit with some pastors, and when they have this kairos, this aha moment, a light bulb moment of where, and they and they have the courage to name. I am being tempted in the area of of security mm. um, where I want to hold on to things and I, I want to be able to control things and even manipulate things. Mm. Um, that's a big moment. That's a that's what we would call in the Christian faith a moment of re an opportunity for repentance. Mm. Um, and and so when we repent of that, when we repent of the times when we have fallen into the trap of like my security comes from my control and leadership, my ability to manipulate how things work. When I repent of that, then there's good news on the other side. And yeah. that good news is that we are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. 
not I. We are the body of Christ, and we get to do this together with one another. We are able to discern the Holy Spirit and His direction with one another. That is the good news. But it, it, we only will come awake to that when we are able to repent of the places where we have given in to the temptation of security. Um, and I think that's a big reason why pastors don't don't try something different. So, wow, yeah, it's like we have that CEO model of somebody's up up at the top, and then they ha- they give the direction to those others, and we think, oh, well, it's we can run it like a business, so it's more efficient and and easier and that kind of stuff. But really, at the end of the day, that that doesn't quite work out well for the rest of the body, right? So. Um, no, yeah, I think that's... it doesn't work out well for CEOs either. I mean, <laughs> that's true. Like you, we just if we yeah. would just take inventory and say, how's this working out for people? It's not. It's 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 not working out well for families. It's not working out well for yeah. generations that follow. It's like it it hasn't worked, and so it's possible that maybe the model that we're replicating is really broken too, and we need a new model, yeah. and maybe. Quite possibly, the church could lead the way by giving an example of a new model. So, mm. and just to be clear, when I say try to knock you off the pedestal, like I did earlier, I think better than that. We just like we challenge each other back and forth. Um, yeah. So I don't. I don't. Yeah, totally. I don't put you up on a pedestal, but I also like respect you and honor you. Um, so yeah. just just to be yeah. clear on that, I don't want didn't want people thinking like. I don't respect you or like you. Uh, I know, uh, Magic Man, you had a question, and we usually we give Ryan one question, so but he had a good one, so we might give him two. So, Ryan, did you want to voice your question now? Sure. Hold on, let me get him on here real quick. Uh, Hold on. Uh-oh. There's you a guy. Produce. I didn't know this was going to happen. Here Denied. You, <laughs> you mean the producer didn't yeah. know he had to produce? There wasn't on my sheet, so I wanted to put that in the show notes that Sorry. Magic Man was going to ask a question. I need like well, he said it in like at chat. least twenty four oh. hours notice that he's going to talk. Come yes, on sir. Now. Yes, sir. I'll talk to HR about that. Uh, hey, Justin. Hey, Ryan. <laughs> hey, yeah. Um, the question I had. Um, so you know, we've we've had conversations before, um, and there's you know plenty of people that we know that have like we've been talking about on here, they've been hurt by the institution of church. Um, and you know, there is, there is a need for some reform, I guess. Um, the question that I have, it's like, how do we do that? But make sure that we don't stray from the truth because it's easy to say, okay, we need to change this. We need to change that. We need to change this. How, what I'm, what my concern is, is to make sure that um, we don't let anything trendy or popular or whatever to, to pull us from what the truth is. Um, you know, yeah. so I know, you know, for example, we've had certain things like um, true love weights, promise keepers, WWJD, things that were cultural, I guess you can say in the past, well, you know, we thought they were the right thing to do. And now we're being told, no, that's toxic. So it's mm-hmm. like, Okay. What what do we do at this point? Does, does that question sure. make sense? I know it's kind of all over the place, but <laughs> no, yeah. How do we keep our eyes makes, on the truth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I um I listened to your guys' last episode with um uh, with Holzkopf, and um it was really good. I, I have a ton of respect for him, and and um one of the things that JT and him talked about was having an anchor point. And I, I think it's really important, um, even as we deconstruct not only the church, but also our faith, that we have an anchor point. And the Bible calls Jesus that anchor. And so um, for me, as I deconstructed my faith, as I deconstructed the institution of the church, my anchor point was that I was going to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Now, that comes with, okay, is it, do is what I believe about who Jesus is and what Jesus says about himself, has that been so uh, molded by my experience in the church, or is it actually what Jesus says about himself? Mm-hmm. And so I, I get that. Um, but for me, it was, okay, I'm, gonna, I am going to, 
I am not going to let go of that Jesus is the perfect representation of who God is. I was not going to let go of that. So for me, that was my, my, my decision. And I, I believe that's why um, my deconstruction journey did not lead me to giving up on my faith. That was never even an option. Not that I'm not a doubter and not that I haven't had major questions about the existence of God, because I am. I am Thomas the doubter every single day when it might, uh, my eyes open. Um, but I am always going to hold to that anchor that Jesus is who he says he is. And I'm, I'm willing to live and die with that, that belief. Um, and so that's the first thing. Um, I think the second thing is um, that it's really smart to go through your deconstruction process with, um, in community. Um, and, and having at least one or two or three people who are willing to ask the hard questions, are willing to say the hard things, um, are not just going to pat, pat you on the back, are not going to just affirm everything that you wake up in the morning and think that is true, um, are not going to affirm everything that you tweeted out and you thought that it was truth. And it was just like, mm. it just bubbled up in your head somewhere. Like we do not, those are not friends. That is, that is not, that is not true friendship. True friendship um, is really what JT was talking about. It comes alongside of and says, okay, I hear you saying this, but let me ask you this. I hear mm. what you're saying here. I hear what you're feeling, but have you thought of this? That is friendship. And, and so if you're walking through deconstruction, don't do it alone because that can be a very, very dark hole, um, a very, very lonely hole. The last thing I would say is I, as I was thinking about this conversation tonight, I was thinking, why do I believe that some people are taking the deconstruction journey to the end where it says, I'm willing to give up my faith? Why is that happening? And I have been reading a book and studying this idea of um, patience and endurance in our faith. And I think that um, in the early church, it wasn't that the early church didn't ask these hard questions and didn't struggle with these same things. They did. We are not somehow more evolved as humans that we now, we are the only ones in all of human history to ask these questions. That is, we have massive egos when it comes to that. They have always (laughs) asked these questions. They've always asked these questions. What they connected to themselves to was the virtue of patience. It was a slow burn. Mm. It was a crock pot. It was the making of good drink. It was that I am not going to make this decision. Like, listen, I, I see all this. I've, I've been deconstructing a long time. Oh yeah. How long? Oh, 12 months, really 12 months. <laughs> like that's not a long time guys. <laughs> Yeah. Like try 40 years. <laughs> that's that's patience. Well, I I deconstructed and made a decision to walk away from my family because you know, I just don't believe the same things anymore. Really? Mm. Really? Like you you're willing to throw all this away. That's interesting to me. That that is really problematic and I think it's because we've lost the the virtue of patience. Um, Alan yeah. Kreider in his book, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church, says that the early Christians believed that patience was the highest virtue. And it, re- it, it literally, um, it was a picture of the patience of God, the patience that God has with us. And I think what's lost in this conversation of deconstruction is the long obedience in the same direction it's the long deep burn it's that this is a long journey and mm-hmm. and so man like if you're out there and you're listening to this you're like man i'm i'm on the edge of throwing my faith away like i would say keep going keep walking there's lots of people yeah. that have come before you that have asked the hard questions and they kept trusting that god is going to be who God is and kept trusting that Jesus is who he says he is. And, and they kept pursuing, they kept asking the questions, they kept knocking on the door and, and good things were down the road. It 
it may have taken 20 years. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Um, that may not make, you know, it may not fit into a certain amount of characters on social media, but I promise you that if you will be patient, you will be more pleased with your life 40 years from now. I promise. Um, yeah, we're just so instant gratis- gratification, instant journey. It's, 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 I think it's killing us, you know, and I think it's, mm-hmm. it's being, it's the, it's what's com- like bringing so many people's faith to such quick ends. Yeah. I, I would say this, guys, I, I've been in the church for 42 years. I would say that in order for me, if I were starting to deconstruct now, the only honorable thing to the last 42 years of my life, would be for me to go through a deconstruction process of 42 years before I said, I don't believe in this anymore. Mm. That would be the only honorable thing to the people that have invested in my life for the past 42 years and the way that God has worked in my life for the last 42 years. If I've given my life to that for 42 years, then I better give myself to 42 years of deconstruction before I decide maybe the first 42 years weren't all that I believed it was. So I think we just need to slow down. So you can't make a good brisket in a microwave. No, you can't. You know, there's an art and you know, you're, you're getting into it and I've just started is you can't make a good brisket. It takes hours and hours and hours and trial and pushing and trying to, you know, manipulate the fire, manipulate the smoke or the cut of meat, what have you. It takes hours for this meal, 10, 12 hours. Yeah. And we don't give it time to rest. You know, even when yeah. we pull it off, we just want to cut it and eat yeah. it. Well, it's also got to rest. You know, it's also got to take yeah. hours just to calm down. Yeah, um, yeah. We're instant gratification. You know, that's that's who we are and what we've become. In 140 characters, we get our news. But there is an art to patience. Yeah. Having a two-year-old, I'm starting to learn that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I <understand. Yeah. laughs> Where, what, and this will be my last question. If anybody has questions, um, feel free. But have we, are we seeing this because we didn't, the church as we, didn't do good enough discipleship earlier in life? Yeah, I, I mean, I think everything is a result of disciple the either good discipleship or the lack of good discipleship. So mm-hmm. I think the leadership that we have in our church is the direct result of of the discipleship that we have practiced. I think that the model or the you know the way we do things is the direct result of the discipleship that we've practiced. I think, yeah, I think that we are reaping what we sowed. This is the harvest, mm-hmm. you know, and. Um, and so, and that, that is, it's pretty convicting, you know? Um, and, and I, I think this is where a lot of the pastors that I get to hang out with talk about that we're, it feels like we've gone off map right now. You know, um, mm. Todd Bolzinger in his book, Canoeing the Mountains talks about that we are off map. And, and I think, and I think that there are a lot of um, women and men out there in the church who are trying their best to dream about and figure out what does the new map look like um you know the the old map of the past at least the past 50 years um has produced um an environment um in the church where it wasn't okay to ask questions where it wasn't mm-hmm. okay to doubt where it wasn't okay to struggle um where it wasn't okay to be transparent and we have to be careful not to swing the pendulum so hard mm. to the other side yeah. where it says, well, you can just give up on your faith. It's cool. Like, and we can't swing the pendulum to the other side where, well, you could just be whatever it is that you you know, want to be. And as long as you're happy, then that's cool. And God is cool with that. Like, and I see that's what's happening is we're swinging the pendulum from one side to the yeah. other. And that's so it's, it's dizzying, isn't it? Like it's, <laughs> sure. man, whew, there's no, no, nothing to hold on to. And so, yeah, it's, it's the result of our discipleship or lack thereof. And, um, you know, and discipleship is not something that just happens 
once a week in an hour on a Sunday. It's not just something that happens um, by, you know, your pastor meeting with you once every 17 months or whatever it is. Like, it's something that takes intentionality. It's something that takes time. It's something that takes sacrifice. Um, and it's done in community. That's The early church was so committed to this idea of communal discipleship. It was not individual one-on-one discipleship. It was a commitment to each other and discipling one another as we follow Jesus, because Jesus is ultimately our rabbi. So we are ultimately being discipled by him, and we are helping one another on that journey, walking together. Yeah, we need more of that. We don't need more programs. We don't need more Bible studies. We don't need more worship services. We don't need more beautiful buildings. We need more people getting together around the table and asking tough questions and asking, what is God saying and how do I obey it? That's how Jesus defines discipleship in Matthew chapter 7. You hear my voice yeah. and you do what I say. And so, yeah, we need more of that. You know, we need, we, we need that and we need to give our time to it and our resources and our energy to that. And I think it'll, I, I have hope. I, I have hope that the we can we can move we can shift the Titanic. I do mm. have hope, and I think this is a great opportunity to do that. We are in a time coming out of two years of a pandemic where there was a lot of sifting in the church. I think this is an awesome opportunity where the world is in need of hope and direction. I think this is a great opportunity for the church to actually disciple people in the way of Jesus. So I'm, I mm. do my best to be hopeful that that can happen. Perfect. Well, I will, we'll look for your new book in Lifeway, how to deconstruct <laughs> church. And <laughs> Lifeway. <laughs> yeah, does anybody have any questions that they want to ask? Anybody else? I think Aaron's dog right. does. <laughs> uh, He's had a lot so to what, say. What, okay. Being annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Being annoying. What's your What's your favorite bourbon right now? By the way. Oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. I'm drinking Old Forester. Is it mm. what? What? Yeah, I like Old Forester right now. That's pretty delicious. Nineteen the nineteen ten. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. Is that the what? Which one is that the that's the right answer. That's the good one. That's the right. <laughs> that's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's the right answer. You know what, man? Um, like, let me tell you. I have. I have. I think God has put some things in my life that have taught me so much about this idea of patience. Um, gardening. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, I, I watched that in my family with my grandfather, my grandmother's, like, teaching me that over time. That takes patience. Um, smoking. Um, meat like you guys you know do that as well and man um i i just smoked some ribs um a couple weeks ago and i marinated those things overnight and that's a commitment you know like and Mm -hmm. then you smoke them for hours and they were they were delicious and then bourbon like that documentary neat i watched that holy crap it blew my mind right it blew my mind like even if you're, you know, I, I get it. Alcohol is not a big thing in, in the church sometimes, but watch that documentary and just think about how long of a process this is. This, that is what faith looks like, is uh, the long journey over time. And so, man, I'm grateful. Like, I'm grateful that God keeps showing this to me just to remind me to linger a little mm. bit longer, you know? So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Where can people find you if they if they want to tune in to the church or watch your sermons, that kind of stuff? Or yeah. just Yeah, don't look me up on social media. That always gets you yeah, and I, I in trouble. That's, that's not a good, <laughs> a good one. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram. Definitely that's head straight to Twitter. Place. Yeah, don't, don't look up my Twitter. Um, uh, look me up on Instagram, JST and Head straight Wallace. there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And then uh, look up our church on YouTube. It's One Life CH. So YouTube.com, One Life CH. And um, I, I believe we put out really awesome stuff that points people to Jesus and makes much of Jesus. 
um, whether it's my teachings or Carrie's teachings or Daniel's teachings, like there's just some good stuff on there. And our, our prayer is that it would encourage you as you are on this journey. And um, we'd love for you to be encouraged by the stuff we put out there. So check out One Life CH on YouTube. Oh, Justin, and we'll have all of your information out on the uh, bio when the website or when the uh, episode launches. So you can go to our website, sfpradio.com, listen to the episode, but click on it and all of his information will be out there. Uh, so we'll have that there. Um, also, one last thing. Did you know in your home state that it is illegal to kiss a woman with a mustache? What? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. hold yeah. on. I need clarification. If the right, woman Ryan. has a mustache, it's the man. Maybe both. But it was definitely the man. I knew you were going to say man. that the way you worded it. It was like, I said it. yeah. Because I'm pretty people. sure, I'm pretty sure if you track some of my family back a few generations, there were some women with mustaches, and so just needed a clarification yeah. there. And nothing wrong with a little mustache. So, yeah, nothing wrong. <laughs> Aaron can fix that though. By the way, if you if you have a mustache, I'll wax it off for you. That's fine. I got you. There you go. So I've asked her multiple times committee. to cut my hair, but she doesn't do it. <laughs> the joke uh, that never Ryan, does. What is, the, what is the official rule, Ryan? Uh, what's the what's the law? That yeah, that if you if a man has a mustache, it's illegal to kiss anybody. I thought it was an addiction was in involved Indiana. in there. Do what? Is, wasn't yes. they had to be in addicted Indiana? to kissing? Is that what I said? Yeah. It, well, that was the way they put it, but the, oh. I saw it actually in a couple places, and the law is mustaches are illegal as long as the bearer of the mustache has a troubling <laughs> addiction towards kissing people. At that, Anyways, yeah. You, you just <laughs> If you have a mustache, you can't kiss anybody. Oh. There you go. <laughs> I like that one better. Oh, <laughs> Justin, it's always a great time. Thank you for coming yeah, on. We appreciate uh, your wisdom. I appreciate the journey with you. Um, and yeah. I look forward to our journey as it continues. Yeah, man. Uh, 4449, if anybody's paying attention to the score. Just throwing that up there. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. <laughs> All right. Am I leaving? Bye. You can stick around if you want to, but I think that's basically the end of the show. There's not much to say. We're, we're, <laughs> we've got 11 minutes left, and I want to watch the rest of this thing. Mm, fair enough. Um, but but I think that there's, you know, I mean, he's kind of dropped the mic at this point. Is I mean, that's kind of it. Yeah. 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 Well, guys, yep. thank you so much again for tuning into the Southern Pride Philosophy Podcast. Next week, we're God willing and the creek don't rise. Hey. We'll have uh, Justin or Jeremy Coleman. He'll be on next week with us uh, from the old TikToks. Look him up from the um, from uh, it's that pastor from Oklahoma. He's going to bring the heat. So as long as we don't have a come to Jesus no. meeting, I'll be I'll be there. He might. He might bring he it. Might. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in. And as always, keep looking up.